So today we are here with Mr. Ross Allen, um, owner of Casual Records. Thank you. He's a big music man. He has a label, Casual Records, which we will talk a bit more about. A DJ with uh, plays on BBC Radio and around the world, obviously. He actually um, does Giles Peterson's show when he's not available. Um, also a and at a few different record labels, which I want to find out more about. Uh, you will. He brought us a uh, signed uh, Space Sick. Yeah, I'm a bit confused. <laughs> I'm musically very confused, but... Um, I think, I don't know, I suppose at the end of the day, all the music I've ever liked is kind of either had a, a good groove or it's been soulful. So that can sort of take in all manner of things. And I think uh, the record, that, the CD that you've got in your hand is a, is a good example of that. Yeah. It's the, the compilation that we put out earlier this year. And uh, I don't know, I suppose if I'm going to preach anything today, it's kind of to be open-minded about music. You can draw stuff from... Wherever. I mean, you know, when I first heard in a kind of little record listening session one particular tune that, that's on this Country Got Soul CD, I, the last thing I thought I'd ever like was country music. Shall we play something? Do you want to play something of it? Yeah. I'll play the tune that, uh, that got me into it. The one that caught all. you. If I can open this. The Bastard Sons of Johnny Cash. <laughs> There's some odd names. Tracking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty odd. I don't know what's wrong with my phone. Seventy soul, very like the bass was amazing and the horns and the arrangement. But that, that's what I mean. It's like you know, you, you never know where these tunes are kind of lurking. Do you know what I mean? You know, there's funk tunes that come from Jamaica and yeah. you know and reggae tunes that come from Germany. Do you know what I mean? With mm. basic channel and yeah, it's true. just sort of. The dub stuff. It's all out there, you just gotta kinda of find it. Wow, it's amazing. So you've A and R'd for a few uh labels and yeah. signed some pretty amazing and popular. Yeah, we've acts. done we've done, we've done a few good things. Had a good yeah. had a few good picks. Yeah, no, we've we've, we've done all right, we are. And yeah. so so how's that been? Um you work for Island. Yeah, I work for Island Records. And that's pretty corporate and you run your own label now and I think Yeah. Well, I used to be at Ireland full time, and they, I had my own subsidiary label there, which signed um, Mark Pritchard, Pesce, Tom Middleton, SpaceX, The Underwolves. Um, I also worked with Talvin Singh when he did his first album, and um, Stereo MCs, The Orb. You know, I also the Sugar Babes for the My Sins with Freak Like Me. That's me who sorted that out. So we've, we've done quite a few things there, but basically Island Records and all major record labels are kind of caught doing certain things, but I think as Jay was saying yesterday, there's, there's, they can work with artists, they can work with people that write songs and perform. They're not very good at handling the kind of producer-based stuff, which yeah. in dance music is what a lot of it is all about, you know. Yeah. It's all that you guys are doing today is... You know, they, they see you as the people they will get in to produce their artists. Right. And their artists are Sugar Babes, Kylie Minogue, you mm. know, whoever. Do you know what I mean? Yes, yeah, yeah. you know. And how do you find it? Of course, there's a big difference of running your own label and working for uh, a corporation of sorts. But it seems like you've, you've been able to achieve what a lot of, uh, I think, A&Rs don't, which is uh, actually original projects and... Uh, music across the board yeah well i think the thing is uh, you know I, the, one of the you know the the three criteria that i've got are i kind of want it to be funky soulful and original mm. and the trouble is if it's original the, and you hear it and being in the position that i am doing the radio and djing in clubs mm. you get to hear things early yeah and you get to hear them a lot earlier than the time the major labels actually want to pick up on stuff mm. You know, they, they, you need to kind of bubble in the underground and kind of create and sell some records and then they turn around and go, yeah, oh, they're What's good, that? we'll have those. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so that's why I needed to set my own label up. Right. T because I was bringing stuff in, you know, like, like Dizzy Rascal mm. and Zero Seven 
stuff that I got through, you know, just being out and about in London. Yeah. And they were just kind of, yeah, they're really good, but, you know, that are they going to sell? Yeah. And, you know, that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. So you just thought, well, you know what? I might as well just do my own label, put my money... And how long is Casual? We basically... Around. The first records came out in kind of July this year. Okay. So we haven't been around a long time, but it's... That's a lot um, of releases in a year. Cunning about. Man, that's, <laughs> that's a lot. Did you I'm question? just wondering um, how long you, you, it's like, maybe you hear things two years before they're going to be released or something like that, even two or three years. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just that thing of, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons I set the label up was because you would hear things and, you know, you knew you couldn't take it into Island Records and you could be, you'd be playing it in a club and you'd be playing it on the radio and you'd be getting a reaction. And the reason to start the label is, well, if I'm, if I'm feeling it and other people are, well, let's put it out, you know. But, yeah, you could, it can be a long time. And so you have uh, another project you just uh, Yeah, I thought I'd give you a little blast of this just to show that I'm not... The Loose Cannons Superstars. Yeah, it's... Uh, I don't know. They, they, well, you make up your own minds what you think of them, but it's the... Uh, it's just that this is the tune that I heard from which we signed the band, and we did sign them immediately to Ireland, and I think it was fairly much a kind of, basically, a finished tune, mm. in so much as a finished tune that a major label would understand had a kind of fresh production, um, a song with a chorus, and, um, but I don't know, it's it kind of reminded me a little bit of a cross between Prince and Basement Jacks, but um, make your own mind up. I will, uh Sounds a lot like Spacey, as, as we were saying. It's yeah, it's very, it's very much, you know, I, I do love that kind of new, bass-heavy kind of funk, yeah. you know. And uh, I suppose in a similar way to um, what happened in the States with hip-hop and all those kind of things, people got into a bit of James Brown and it became the rare groove scene. Mm. And uh, I don't know, hopefully this will be in the right place. But tunes like this were just... Uh, Anthems on Pirate Radio. So that was where we, all, uh, we kind of got our education in our old records. And uh, that ties in quite nicely with uh, the stuff that Soul to Soul were doing and that whole kind of rear groove break scene in uh, the London style of it. I don't tend to play loads of those out, but I, I just kind of keep it funky and, you know, kind of expand the sort of... I mean, I've always got a little, a little selection of old funk tunes. Mm. I've always got a little bit of disco... You know, I've always got kind of new hip hop, some ragga, some house. Mm. You know, just so you can kind of. I mean, I, when I started DJing, I was I used to do house parties, okay. and I used to play f all night. Yeah. You know, we'd start at kind of ten and finish at sort of eight, nine in the morning, and you know, you'd have a couple of people. Real put parties. Records. Sorry. Real parties. Yeah, they were. Yeah, it was, it was kind of off the back of that. That I mean, the, uh, you know, the whole reason I'm into this and doing this is just because I used to love going out. Mm. You know, going to clubs was this other world you could get into, you know, you'd, you'd be at school and you'd listen to the radio. Ironically, the DJ that got me into it all was Pete Tong. Really? Pete Tong used to have a radio show on Invicta Radio, which was a little regional radio station in Kent, mm. which is just kind of southeast of London. And uh, I used to have a bath every Sunday night before I went to school once a week. Still do. Mm. And... Um, we would, um, I would, I was just listening to the radio in the bath and I would tune in and I'd all of a sudden I had this funky music, like some hip hop or something. And I was like, what was this? And it was Pete Tong doing his thing back in 1986. Wow. And he was playing everything, yeah. you know, he kind of, I think, he, you know, with him he saw, he saw where the money was at right. in the house thing and just went straight down that road. But to start with, you know, he was the one who first played me Run DMC, you know, introduced me to kind of what Giles Peterson does by playing tracks off of the Jazz Juice albums, introduced me to like the first house records that I'd heard, right. you know, the stuff on DJ International and stuff coming out of, you know, Supertronics in New York and all those kind of things. And, you know, Anita Baker, an old soul record, so yeah. I've got to give it up to Pete Tom. Do you see like a um, surge of... Um Guys, m more artists like a Herbert or, you know, with the electronic. I mean, just from what you're hearing, you listen to a lot of music, you have a lot of things coming at you. And just from the electronic-based scene, are you seeing a lot of those type of, not 
specific to that sound, but just artists that you can, you know, say you have a, a hundred CDs in two weeks, you know, yeah. are there like five that are like, from an electronic standpoint of view, you know? Um, I don't know really. I, I, I think I've kind of stepped back from it a bit. I mean, the, the thing, a lot of the new hip hop I really like because I yeah. think that incorporates a lot of the electronics. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, whereas it was always something that I was, you know, you, I always was kind of thinking about different types of music and mm. what if you put that with that? And, yeah. you know, and then, you know, when you heard the first sort of Missy Elliott records and even some of the kind of Just Blaze productions, you're like, they're like techno records with people rapping over them. Yeah. To me, that was, that was really fresh, do you know what yeah. I mean? And I, and I still think it, and it is really fresh. It's just whereas when you hear a lot of kind of new electronic records, I mean, I quite like some of the sort of glitchy kind of things yeah, and stuff really like sort of Apex-based stuff. With, yeah. But it's, I've kind of heard a lot of it before, do you know what yeah. I mean? I just want to hear, I either want a tune I can hum along to, yeah. which leads you kind of cut up to sort of maybe kind of R&B or, or kind of the poppier side yeah. of things. Yeah. Or... Or a really good melody. I mean, out of the new kind of electronic people, I suppose someone like Ulrich Schnauss mm -hmm. is someone that you put on and it just kind of washes over you and you get that, that little feeling of, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is a good tune. Because it can be emotional as well. I listen to some, some noise records and friends have and I swear I couldn't, I couldn't stop the record. It was like 54 minutes of just noise, but it is an emotional yeah, thing as well. Yeah, it's one of those kind of undefinable quantities, do you know yeah. what I mean? That you, you know, when you put music on, it either hits you or it doesn't, yeah. you know, and that's why I can't limit myself to just being into one sort of genre or pushing one genre because I'd get bored, yeah. you know. I'd, I mean, I'd, you know, I'd, I just can't listen to one thing. It's just that I need to, I always, you know, even if I'm, I mean, I got, in, got into REM when I was driving through the States because yeah. it was on the radio and I was looking out the, as we were driving across and it seemed to be the right music okay. for that time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you put yourself in a box, you miss out on so much fun. At the end of the day, the reason you're into music is because it, it gives you that little tingle. It's that little yeah. sensory perception that's... That's me. I mean, I think with the house thing, uh, you know, around that time, which is when the first house records that we were hearing, it just was so kind of fresh and interesting. In that time, it's just, like I said, it's, 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 some, it's that machine that defined a specific time and, and style of music. And, and I think different that was, genres as well. Yeah, I think that was one of the sort of, you know, one of the, the better acid house records. There were kind of a lot of them knocking about, but that just had a kind of bit of depth to it. And, a bit more of know. a song, I believe. The, yeah, it's more the, hooky. The arrangement of yeah. cool. I mean, it still sounds, I just think it yeah. sounds brilliant now, you know. Um, I guess a lot of people here, I think, are probably quite independent-minded in their approach. So um, some of us would want to start our own labels, and you've, you know, you've released quite interesting music across the board. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you went about setting up your label and how, how much it cost and what, what kind of things you had to do to get it started? Well, um, I mean, basically, yeah, we, we, we found someone who had some money to, <laughs> to sort of put behind us, which was, I've always kind of shied away from, from doing it myself because I always kind of felt I just didn't want to put out white labels and I'm quite into the way that the sort of the records are presented and that whole kind of thing. So, I mean, out of the labels that I've had, I haven't actually put any of the money up myself, which was obviously a help. Um, but aside from that, I mean, it's just that sort of, you know, you, you, you just got to find a tune you like and think you can do something with it. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd always kind of test the water with something first, you know what I mean? You know, if you're going into a kind of business venture, you want to know that you're going to be able to, not maybe be retire off the back of it, but be able to sell the ones you've got so you can then move on and, and do another one, you know, being fairly sort of, pragmatic about it. Um, Maybe um, distribution? Yeah, distribution is, is an interesting one. I mean, you know, with the new label that we set up, we were, we were able to go to a quite sort of reputable distributor in the UK just because of my kind of track record and my partner's track record. But I mean, that's, you know, we, we were t you were talking the other day, I think, about the, the van services in the UK. And that's obviously a very easy way to get stuff out and you can also do a P&D deal, which is pressing and distribution, where you just basically take your DAT or your CD, they master it for you, they cut the record for you, you give them the artwork, and they do it all for you. The only downside to that is that sometimes you might not get paid. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of... But, but at least they're kind of... 
you know, at least you're getting stuff out there. Do you know what I mean? And I think the thing is, at the end of the day, it's all about how good the music is. If the music is good enough, you know, I mean, that record Voodoo Ray, we're playing that, what, 14 years after it first came out. That first came out on a tiny little label in Manchester. And I don't think that, that a guy called Gerald had any more kind of links than anyone else, but because it's a good tune, it then got picked up and his whole career built off the back of that record, you know. So it's, it's all, at the end of the day, it's all about the music. If the music is good enough, you will suffer, you know, setbacks and pitfalls and, but it, you kind of get through, you know. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, the, it's very easy, I think, to sort of be bitter about things and, oh, well, that, they fucked up my distribution, they fucked that up, whatever. But, yeah, you didn't get paid, but getting paid is the worst, <laughs> not getting paid is the worst one. But it's, you know, you, if, if, if you're talented, you, you do get through, do you know what I mean? If you, you, it's all about perseverance, you know, when you get to those pitfalls, you need to kind of just go, right. As well, the, the music dictates what the future is going to hold for you yeah. as, as an independent, I believe. Yeah, totally. I think it's, it's all about doing something, you know, it's, again, it's doing something fresh and interesting. Yeah, People exactly. want that. I kind of brought that along because it was an example of another little phase of London clubbing, which they called, um, which was born out of the back of the sort of acid house explosion and that kind of dance scene, which was just where, I think it's probably because people were doing quite a lot of drugs. And they were opened up to sort of uh, all manner of different types of records. It, they, they called it, it was the Balearic scene, which people like Danny Ramplin mm. and um, Paul Oakenfold and all those sort of DJs were were key in uh, putting together. And it was, uh, I suppose that, that kind of formed the basis of, of dance music in the UK not being such a black music based mm. event, if you like, you know, it was always kind of, you know, there was black house music from Chicago and from Detroit yeah. and hip hop. And these London DJs were kind of like, well, you know what, we like a few pop records, we like a few, so we'll chuck a bit of that in. And then you started getting these fusions of, you know, I mean, that's kind of a funky little tune, but there was people playing like Depeche Mode records and, and all, all sorts of things. It was another real, I really liked it because it was a real melting pot. There were a, real, a lot of really dodgy records that came out of it, but um, there always is, you know. It was, it's, it was quite an interesting time and just that you would hear a whole spectrum of stuff, whereas... Whereas before, you would just hear kind of funk and mm. black-based music. Really yeah, You know, it's just another area of music. I've got, there's a tune I could play now, actually, which is quite an interesting little thing. But, um, yeah, I, I, it was just another area that kind of opened up to us. I think, you know, through DJs like Jonathan Moore from Cold Cut and Giles Peterson, again, you know, they're the people that kind of always turn you on to these tracks. You know, they're the sort of out there, finding interesting kind of funkier genres of music and um so most of these things they kind of just fell into your lap or yeah did you, you know, go search for some of these records yeah i mean you know i'm, I'm always looking for records do you mm, know did what you I mean? say okay I'm, I'm looking for country soul i'm looking for no shit it's, that it, you, you know you know what it's like you, you, you're just around people that like music yeah. you're listening to the radio you're reading magazines there's quite a lot of music in this genre that you know i like i, I don't know anything about it yeah like how does how do you find all of this music? I ju I've just got good friends yeah, well, obviously. <laughs> who are quite sad wow. and always in <laughs> record shops. And uh, wow, it's um. Well, you guys have the advantage in London that you have the great, the best record shops there. You can find yeah, it's, everything. It's, it's good in London, but most of those. I mean, you know, when I first heard this music, we'd go around to the record fairs and you'd ask people, and they'd be like that. All the dealers would just be like, "I've never heard of them." Yeah. You know, and it, it, it was the same, you know. With but did you have specific names that you were looking for? Or after you, after you yeah, heard the first song? Yeah, you'd just go around and, you know, I mean, that, that Travis Wamack truck, you'd go around and you'd just say, have you got it? And yeah. I mean, the good thing now is you can get on eBay one leads to the other, or Gem yeah. or one of those yeah. things and just tap in the name of the yeah, artist. The yeah. And you get a list, whether they've got it or not, of, of the, the artist, the album. One of the things that you have to realize is that Major labels own so many of the catalogues, yeah. but the way they actually police the catalogues in terms of, you know, you're, you're being a bit of a train spotter, you'll know that that catalogue was bought by that label at that time, and they own the rights to it. Mm. Now, we would ring up Universal and mm. say, you own the rights to this track, and they'd be like, no, we don't. And we'd be like, you do. Yeah. No, you don't.
and it, it would go on and you'd turn around and you'd, we, you know, the good thing about the net is you can just get on. A lot of these people that have been making records have set up their own web pages. Mm -hmm. So you tap in someone's name into Google and you get a list of everything they've done, but you also get, you know, you're likely to get their home page. And we just did <coughs> quite a lot of detective work. You know, just, you know, we would ring up the majors and if they had the rights to it, or would ring the, the smaller labels that have bought a lot of catalogues. If they had the rights to it, then we'd license it from them. If not, we would get on the internet, track them down, and loads of people we, we found, and that's why I've been in Nashville a few times this year, was just to kind of, you know, we'd made the connection, we'd got their phone number, we went out to see them. I mean, and one of the sort of the evolution of this is that next February, we've ba all the people that are alive on this record, we've tracked down. Oh. And we're going to go and put them all back in the studio wow. and cut a sort of a new record, a kind of, if you like, wow. it sounds a bit cliched, but a Buena Vista Social Club meets Johnny Cash yeah, yeah. kind of album where we put them all back and we've got a load of their new tracks and just do a kind of rootsy, back to basics, album that would sound like this. We're not going to record it digitally. We're going to do it all onto two-inch tape so yeah. you get the sound that these guys had. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you know, it's just like, I think, I don't know, I think that's, the, you know, to, I mean, I'm not a producer. I'm an A&R person. But I think one of the things that, I think there's a, it's a fine line a lot of the time. If you're, I think with what a lot of you guys are doing with the technology, I don't understand the technology. I'm not really that interested in it. I just want to hear good records. So in that way, I'm not a producer. But when it comes to a kind of classic recording like this that we're going to do, it's like part of the production is to kind of go, well, you know what, you guys really don't want to be singing over a load of breakbeats. Mm. You want to be set, you want to find the setting that is going to make them shine and the songs that they've done shine in the, the best environment, you know. So we're going to take it back and do that. Did you find it quite expensive to, to license, though? It's not... Um, it's not cheap. I think to put that album together cost us about 10 grand yeah. in English, 10,000 yeah. pounds. So, I mean, that's why we needed the backers, do you know what I mean? Because yeah. I haven't got that sort of money to put into it. But, you know, it's quite you can go around and, I mean, you know, the record industry is in kind of a bit of a... A funk now. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's, a bit it's shrinking. It's a bit easier to license at the moment. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, that, that's the thing. Deals. As much as it's, as it's harder to sell records, everyone's feeling the pinch so that the prices come down and... Yeah. You know, I think that, again, you know, if you're talking about studios yeah, yeah. and hiring out studios for bands to work in, that has come down yeah, because exactly. of the ease of access to all the technology and the yeah. stuff that you and can do. And so many home studios now. Yeah. People don't need to have the necessity to go. No, exactly. Yeah. So if you do want to go to a bigger studio to get a, a better mix down on mm. a bigger desk or whatever, the, the prices compared to a few years ago are, yeah, are much, much cheaper. One of the things that I kind of like to think that I do with the records that we make is all the way down the line, the process, is maximise what you do, you know, and I think when it comes to selling records to DJs that are going to be played on sound systems, mm. the cut of the record, the mix down of the record, and all those things, just so you push the, so you know, especially with, I mean, with, with all music, do you know what I mean, but especially with technology, you know, with... Yeah techie kind of music, do you know what I mean? It's, it's so much, you can do so much of it, and I yeah. think that the cutting process is one of those, mo one of the most important parts at the moment. You can do so much of it if you take it to the right engineer. I think it's amazing, you can, you can, which I actually um, advise a lot of you guys who are doing uh, your own records, you know, go get an acetate cut, you know, and play it that, that night you're playing out. There's nothing like the, the instant, Instant, uh, it's a lot cheaper appeal. than pressing up 500 copies. It's a lot cheaper than, 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 yeah, than pressing up Realizing it's not 500 copies and it sounds like shit and you're like, fuck, I'm broke now. Yeah, I, th I think that's <laughs> another thing that's, that, that is, you know, from an A&R point of view, is the fact of refining what you do. I have a question about um, the, the current condition that the uh, record companies are going through in regards to digital media. Um, I want to know... How are they reeling, or how are they coping with that situation? Does it make your job a bit more difficult because they feel like they have to always pick the most, you know, sellable material because they're losing money from, you know, MP3 downloads and whatnot? And also, where do you see uh, the future of, of music going in the sense of 
distribution and the way for artists to be able to better market themselves, not necessarily through a major? I think that um, m major record labels are completely shitting themselves about what's going on at the moment because they, you know, the thing with major record labels is they're so kind of, they're a bit like dinosaurs, they're very sort of heavy and slow to react. Mm. And they tried to kind of brush the whole sort of MP3 thing under the carpet and then the thing with Napster and all those kind of things. But now they realize that there's, there's no way forward. And I think that they have to embrace it. You know, they're sort of, I think, I think it's available commonly in the States, but in the UK, you can't actually, I don't think you can buy downloads from majors. You know, they're, they're, I think it's something that's, that, that's coming next year. So they're embracing it, but kind of slowly. And I think that what that does is it does make them very conservative when it comes to music because they don't know. The, I think we were talking about this in, a, in an A&R meeting the other week, that, you know, your Britneys and your big acts, are gonna, people are going to go and buy those records because they're, they sell to a kind of, I think it's a kind of generational thing. There's, you know, the, the people that are coming through buying music are very used to the technology and to getting downloads and it's you know it's free music if I was if I was kind of growing up now and I heard these records on the radio or wherever I'd just go to L LimeWire or whatever it is and just go put in the title and go right I'll have that and put it onto a CD and go out and play it so I think that it's it's hurting a lot of the newer acts I mean it was interesting what Jay was saying yesterday about a lot of his music isn't available online because it's kind of quite a real, real underground sort of scene but I don't think that's necessarily true for a lot of other dance forms. I think if you're into drum and bass or you're into rap or whatever, you can get nearly all those things. They just they pop up and you can download them and they're yours for nothing. So if you're new and coming through, it affects, it affects the way major labels are because they know who downloads what. And I think if you are an, a more established artist or you are, say you are REM or someone, the people that kind of grew up with your music may not, they may well be, may not be as aware of the technology. Mm. And also I think there's a kind of culture that goes with it, which is, you know, I've got my box of records. You know, that's what I grew up with. I bought records. I kind of, when these came along, I was like, and then when I started to do the radio, it was like, well, you know what? I've got to get with CDs because, you know, there's so, many, so much music I can't play. And now it's, it's one of these, do you know what I mean? You know, and it's, it's that thing of, I'm forced, because I want a lot of the music, to use these new technologies. Yeah. Whereas a lot of people who buy music that are older don't have to buy, you know, they'll just go and buy a CD or, you know, if they're still kind of into their turntable and the whole kind of, aesthetic. that whole kind, yeah, that whole kind of aesthetic of that, they will, you know, they will buy the vinyl version because you can get it if you want it. But I think for most people, having that kind of object, you know, for kids growing up now, it's like, it's a culture that is kind of dying out, you know. I mean, you know, I know there's probably people who are like, well, I'm always going to want my records, but you have to think, if you were kind of 12, 13 now, and your friends at school were playing you these tracks from, on whatever format, and you could just go home and on your computer at night and just go, Ch -ch -ch -ch, and it's in your house, why do you want a 12-inch bit of vinyl to put it on, you know, if you're not, if it's not part of your culture, you know, it's kind of, I think it's, I've been thinking about it quite a lot because obviously setting up my own label, you know, we want to sell records, you know. I how does, that, how does that affect, what is your take on it? If, if you go to LimeWire and this album is, if I go yeah, exactly. out, Country Got Soul and I get seven of the songs. I mean, it's, I mean you know, all the, the one thing that, that, that I want to do, which we're working on at the moment with our website at the label, is, is so that people can buy downloads. Because I think that, you know, you can, people can nick it or they can, you know, if people appreciate that, what you're going through as artists and labels. And I think that's another reason that major labels suffer is because no one gives a shit about major labels yeah. because they're just yeah. like, people just see them as kind of raping the, the scenes of music and screwing the last drop of money out of them with the cheapest packaging and cutting all the overheads. Mm. And, you know, that's why I, I want to do my own label because I, I, I actually like the packaging. But I, you, I don't know, it's, diff it's difficult to know where it's going to go because, yeah. you know, it could just... It's kind of just open this down to the public. If they want to take your rep music, they can. And the distribution, he was asking a question about the distribution. Well, I, th I mean, again, I think that, you know, leading on from that and the way that the kind of the formats are kind of gradually being pushed to the side, it's, 
it wouldn't surprise me if you could see a time when people are just going to go to their computers, tap in a label, a band, and people are just going to buy the music straight from the source. You know. Well, currently, uh, uh, we, your situation is probably similar to mine. You have a major distribution company that has distribution deals throughout the world. Yeah. Separate situations in each country. Yeah. Which kind of works because you get um, promotion and marketing in each situation. Yeah. So it kind of works, I think, a bit. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, I, I think that's, uh, you know, the, that situation is kind of the final extreme, the one I just said. Oh, yeah. I mean, at the moment, yeah, it's, you know, the, the whole distribution process, if you are an yeah, indie. If you were starting a label, that's ultimately what you would, I think, want to do is... Yeah, you, you get, you, with you a get big, local a distribution. Dog, like, you know, like, like we try to, get, you know, get with a distribution that, uh, that has yeah. coverage. Yeah, no, you, you, I mean, initially you want local distribution, then you want it kind of national and then international depending upon how the records, the, the ripples that your record sends out around the world, you know? Speaking about the downloading with um, the MP3s, and I was just making a footnote of, um, you know, the, the, the iPod situation with, with Apple. And they started the, um, what I guess it was the iPod store, and within the first week they had sold over a billion uh, downloads, which I think still to today is the number one download site, which I thought was very very um, inspiring for that. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think scene. the thing is, you know, the, the future is selling this music, you know, as downloads, I think. And I think if you can do that, then, then we've, all, we've all got a future. <laughs>